you very much for joining us today uh, for our webinar, Look Before You Leap, Governance Tips for Making the Move to Office 365. Um, to start, I wanted to first introduce uh, our panelists that are going to be joining us for today's webinar. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Bennett Borden, Chief Data Scientist and Chair of the Information Governance Group at Drinker, Biddle and Reef. Uh, we have Scott Whips, who heads up Records and Information Management at Honda here in North America. Uh, Susan Emery, Vice President of Product Management at Viewpoint. Uh, and I'll be monitoring the, day, uh, the uh, webinar today. Uh, I help handle information governance here at Zeal Technologies. So, um, uh, Bennett, Scott, Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. So, so a little bit to get started, we wanted to first throw up a couple statistics um, on, on the key topic we're talking about today, which is really a, a strong adoption we're seeing um, from, you know, on-premise Microsoft uh, products into their cloud suite, Office 365. Obviously, this is something that I'm sure everyone on the webinar today is familiar with. Uh, some of you may already have moved there. Some may be considering it. Um, uh, but generally, we, we've seen that as of now, I mean, Q2 2016, about a year ago, uh, we're seeing about 22.3% of uh, enterprise employees are using at minimum one Office 365 application. Uh, that's up from you know the previous year by about six, six and a half, seven percent. Um, and if you look at the graphic on the right, you'll you'll note that there's obviously different applications that are being leveraged. Uh, but the key ones that we're seeing getting adoption very quickly uh, are Exchange Online, moving email into Office 365, uh, OneDrive for Business, which um, several several enterprises are leveraging to give. Uh, end users access to sort of their own online file share or personal drive, if you will. SharePoint, we've actually seen a slightly slower adoption. Uh, a lot of people are using either SharePoint online uh, in hybrid mode with their on-premise uh, offering, but in general we're seeing obviously a big move towards Office 365, and, and that means a lot of different things to different people. Um, the, the focus for us today is to really look at Office 365, not so much from a productivity standpoint, but how do we look at Office 365 when it comes to governance? And what are the things that we need to keep in mind and consider as we make the move to uh, Office 365? Um, so getting a little bit more into it, because there's, there, there's so many different components around Office 365 and what that suite is really about, um, Susan, I was actually going to ask you to maybe jump in here and, and maybe cover a little bit around the, the different tool sets within the 365 suite. Um, talk through some of those so it provides a little bit uh, more context for our audience. Sure, and I think one of the things, just thinking back of that chart, there's the rollout in how enterprises have adopted, but then you look at the individual user adoption and you realize that from a governance perspective, trying to span across these different silos of applications, the active user rate is what's important because if your users aren't logging in and controlling it, then if they aren't actively engaged in those applications, the built-in governance controls that require user actions aren't being leveraged, and therefore you're opening up a tremendous governance gap in your overall strategy. So as you look at what's involved in Office 365, you have the traditional Microsoft Office suite, but you also have a tremendous amount of new content source generation. This is coming in through Skype for Business, OneDrive, Yammer. Uh, there are new search capabilities related to Delve. And Office, Microsoft continues to add to Office 365. So it's important from a governance perspective to be aware of the new types of content and the user populations within your organization that are going to be drawn to one or another of these applications. It's also important to note that in terms of governance controls, it varies from application to application. So while your IT team is having a huge boon in terms of getting out from under currency issues, upgrades, uh, planning and scaling, uh, in terms of growth and flexibility, you, from a governance perspective, need to consider these new format types that you're going to be adopting, uh, how that impacts your processes across the board from a governance and legal perspective, and also take a look at what types of 
policy change this may drive. So one of the consideration points with Yammer is it's a very um, interactive tool for, uh, it's, it's almost a social media presence within your enterprise. And that's a very different style of interaction and may require some significant new thought around your current policies. Great, great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Susan, uh, for for that perspective. So, um, so obviously, as Susan covered, there's a number of different tool sets, and we have to take a little bit of a different lens depending on what what content type we're talking about. Yammer being a great example, um, but you know, one of the other things that people uh, always ask questions about is you know, there's so many different licensing options within Office 365, all at of course different price points. But but really, the key piece to focus on here is what are you actually getting as part of your licensing deal? You know, what, what's in, what's out, what governance functionality that Office 365 offers is built in, how far does that take you? Um, so, uh, so again, I'd, I'd offer it up to the panel to, uh, you know, Susan, if you want to talk through some of the different licensing options, um, um, I'm happy for you to start and, and obviously uh, to, to jump in as well. Sure. So Microsoft is definitely incenting enterprise organizations to make this move. And it's driving a lot of adoption. But as Fried mentioned, each of these licensing options includes with it different application sets. So you'll see, obviously, the further to the right, the more expense, the greater number of applications, so these new formats for collaboration and communication. But also notice the differences, and it's not quite as clear, but there are significant differences in the level of governance controls you have at these various license levels. So be very cognizant of what license level you're getting. It's very easy for organizations to communicate, oh, Office 365, it's coming. But in terms of really planning what this means from a records, legal, compliance, even security process standpoint, it's important to know and dig below into not just the bullet points, but the more detailed functional mm -hmm. and capability listings. And Susan, that's a great point. This has been a, you know, because if you look at how 365 rolled out, um, you can see that the things that the, that the company was most concerned about had to do with security and access, right? And so, because when everybody goes to the cloud, remember a few years ago, everybody was always afraid to go to the cloud, right? There was all these concerns, and now all those concerns have really been uh, largely allayed, and we're seeing this huge uptick in going to um, the cloud applications generally, but 365 specifically. And, and so, if you'll notice that the first things they start to talk about as you're moving from left to right and the kinds of licensing options you have, there really is about security um, and collaboration, but security. That is by far the most developed set of suite of products that they have. And it's not until you get really to the E5 level that you start to see what we would call governance at all. Um, the, in the E3 licensing model, you've got some basic e-discovery capabilities, and these are fairly basic. Um, it's not until the E5 level that you get anything approaching what we are used to kind of in the e-discovery space. And it's the, as far as information governance goes, when the idea of controlling the creation, use, and disposition of data, that's only available in the E5 level as well. In fact, the, the new kind of data governance suite um, is supposed to launch really any time now where they have finally started to draw in some of the um, predictive analytics piece and searching capabilities from the Equibio purchase that you're starting to see roll out. So it is, as Susan says, it's really important to understand that 365 is a, is a great tool. Like It really does a lot of great things for an enterprise, but it's important to see how that um, fits into your larger governance program. No, thanks. Thanks a lot for that perspective, Bennett. And, and actually, I, I was actually going to ask, I mean, you know, one of the things that we, we hear a lot about as people move to Office 365, the, the, one of the first things people look at, you know, as sort of the checkboxes are, you know, the basic e-discovery capabilities. You know, can I preserve my data? Do I have the ability to produce content, um, you know, to take to some of my downstream capabilities? But where do you see it from a broader information governance perspective? Like you said, we're starting to see some of that predictive analytics and, you know, some of the things from the Equivio purchase finally coming into the Office 365 suite, but when you look at information governance more broadly, you know, you're talking about disposition, classification of content, and, and 
uh, you know, broader governance across all that data set, where, you know, not just within these licensing models, but where do you think all of that lies within Office 365? Yeah, I was just uh, going to say at Honda, uh, it's, it's definitely a concern. I mean, we're, we're bringing it in for most of the applications that um, were on the earlier slide. However, we have uh, things that really are not a piece of uh, the Office uh, 365 strategy that we, we have to still maintain governance for. So, um, you know, from, from that perspective, I give an example, uh, file shares. Um, we still have a, a massive amount of file shares, and we have a file share for every department, and some have multiple, and there's no strategy yet to move those from an IT perspective to, uh, or strategy yet to another, or uh, to an Office 365 area. So we're using, um, you know, the ZL tool to uh, maintain uh, our, our, not only e-discovery, but um, also do our records management and making sure that dispositions um, manage with uh, file shares as well. What we're seeing across the board is Office 365 represents an additional set of suite, a suite of additional suite of products actually that needs to be governed. That it's not necessarily helping reduce governance, it's actually adding additional governance uh, source content sources. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, we're having to uh, now deal with Yammer, which didn't exist before Office 365. Right, right. No, and, and Scott, that's actually a nice transition. I mean, from, from sort of the client perspective, um, and, you know, I'll let you speak to this, but, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that decision was made around Office 365, what some of the key benefits people are looking at, and, and then, you know, what are those impact areas and, and some of the risks that you had to consider? Because obviously, having made that transition, you've, you've sort of been through all of this, so maybe you could, we could shed a little bit of light around that. Right. Well, this was uh, really not, it was more of an IT decision, um, and it was done on a global basis, so uh, we were, were basically along for the ride. Um, but again, you know, there were some cost savings uh, components to it, um, like the slide shows, and I think uh, most enterprises are looking for that. Um, but from an, a, a better integration collaboration space, um, you know, we, we prior to this we were a Lotus Node, so there were some incompatibilities between um, some of the office products like SharePoint and, and Notes, so um, and also uh, between same time and uh, uh, some of the other tools we were using for web meetings. So trying to utilize all the uh, components of um, the Office 365 offerings. Uh, promises to be more uh, highly integrated and so forth. So all those things were looked at as, as benefits um, toward moving toward Office 365. Um, as far as, uh, you know, but looking at it from a compliance, um, you know, gov information governance, uh, uh, and also looking at making sure we maintain confidentiality and everything else, um, there's a lot of things to consider. And uh, e-discovery um, certainly is one of the major areas that I um, in was concerned with, and uh, you know, looking at the product uh, a year or so ago, a year and a half, two years ago, when we first started considering uh, what the impacts were going to be, um, that the, the suite of tools that are, are part of Office 365 really didn't meet our legal uh, team's need. Um, and from a technology standpoint, it's it's uh, there's some difficulties um, with trying to. Uh, gather a large amount of data from, say, Office 365 and somehow then um, transfer that to your outside counsel or to, uh, to, the, to your, even your in, in, inside counsel as to, um, you know, review process and so forth with e-discovery. So, um, you know, we were really concerned with trying to u utilize the, um, the tool that was in place with Office 365. Huh? So, uh, that was definitely a, a major consideration for us. Right, right. And and again, from sort of a client perspective, and Bennett, feel free to jump in here as well. I mean, because I know you, you, you advise a lot of clients as they look at some of these moves, but what are some of those risk factors? Because, you know, Scott made a really good point that some of the, I'm not even going to say some, I think the majority of these moves are really driven from yeah. a, IT perspective and you know cost savings and, and there's a big business case it sort of comes top down uh, but we have to address it so I mean what are some of these risks that and, and you know both Scott and Bennett that, that you guys have seen uh, from advising your clients as well as Scott what you might have faced as you as you made them yeah and that's such a good point because 
often we see this IT driven, and it's of course it's a big IT project, but as with all information governance decisions, you need the perspectives of each of the stakeholders, the business, the IT side, so the technology, you know, the access and savings and all of that piece, but you've got to understand the regulatory, legal, e-discovery sides of it. And so even the decision to go to 365 and what kind of hybrid solution you have. Like like Scott said, we've got almost every organization that goes to 365, it's not like that's their only platform. But now they've got a hybrid of some stuff on-prem, some stuff in the cloud, and so their governance structure becomes more complicated. It's completely doable, right? As long as you've got the right people thinking through what your um, processes are to meet your legal, regulatory, and business needs, but it complicates it. So what we're seeing as some of the um, more successful implementations of 365 is when you have a governance structure that includes it as simply another type of repository. And so how do I preserve here? How do I identify stuff? How do I collect it? How do I move it to review tools if I need to? How do I get rid of stuff when I need to? You know, the cloud providers um, focus very often on this is a way to manage large amounts of your data and storage is virtually unlimited so it doesn't matter anymore. But it's not just a storage issue. It's the fact that you've got all this legacy information and potentially security related information um, and confidential business information out on the cloud. So of course you want to get rid of it at some point. And so it's walking through those questions when you're making an implementation decision that just treats this as just another repository. Yeah, Ben, that's, that's a great point. And it really is important for your records, uh, your legal team uh, to make um, sure that they're providing uh, input to the project team that's bringing in or uh, converting everybody to Office 365. And I, I would also include um, maybe your HR teams because you really need to change, unfortunately, all the, uh, especially with email, um, a lot of the processes that are in place don't work once you go to the, uh, the cloud um, format. Excellent point. Thanks. Thank you, Scott and Ben. And I think you know, and I think that's something that requires a lot of emphasis is that as people move to Office 365, uh, you know, I think, I think Bennett, you, you said it, it's another repository, right? I mean, there's, there's a bit of a thinking that, okay, now everything is sitting there, but especially in the world we are today with big data and, and you know, more analytics initiatives and things like that, I mean, these applications continue to pop up where you will still have those on-premise footprints, um, and, and it's, it's equally important to you know, not ignore that you have to look at holistically as another repository, not as, okay, everything is sitting now, you know, within Office 365. Also goes back to sort of some of the adoption stuff we were talking about earlier um, and, and how people aren't going all in. You know, they're taking, they're taking sort of a phased approach uh, as they go from one content type or one application to the next. Um, but, but talking a little bit about, you know, so as people have made this move to Office 365, I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, we're doing this webinar today is there has been a lot of, there, there's been a lack of clarity of, look, what am I actually getting as part of Office 365 uh, from a governance perspective? We've, we've covered that in the first half here, but we are still seeing a, a very strong focus and interest, and, and Scott, of course, you can speak to this as well, um, on, you know, why do people continue to archive and, and try to have sort of a centralized control of all of this data, specifically from a governance perspective? Uh, not to detract from this should be a reason not to move to Office 365. There's many compelling reasons to do that, and we're, I, I think we're going to continue to see strong adoption you know, in the coming months and years. But, but why are people still looking at this from uh, a pure governance perspective and saying, look, it, it's just another repository, and I still need sort of that centralized control? So a few of the benefits that we've seen, um, one is obviously holistic governance, right? So this is what... what uh, Scott and Bennett were just talking about that that don't see it as all my content being there seeing it as another repository that I have to manage um, you know in a hybrid environment some stuff sitting in 365 sometimes uh, we still have a lot of on-prem footprints we have hybrid uh, deployments as well um, but I, I need sort of a holistic view from an e-discovery compliance records perspective where regardless of which stakeholder is requesting that content or needs access to it there's a very specific set of, of requirements that we need to adhere to from a governance perspective um, that also go very far as far as reducing you know, our risk. I mean, one of the things as you move to Office 365 is how do I continue to make sure that I'm still securing my content, I'm still classifying data, I'm still being able to reduce my risk by actually getting rid of things I don't need. 
Um, and how do I increase accessibility specifically for governance stakeholders? Uh, Office 365 does a, a wonderful job for the end user um, and you know, for them to get access to their content, but, but how, do I, how do I purpose fit it for, for legal, IT, HR, you know, other stakeholders that need access to this content unfettered uh, that doesn't disturb the, the end users and, and what they're doing day to day, but continues to allow them to, um, uh, to, to meet their obligations from a, from a legal and compliance perspective. Um, and, and then finally, how do I decrease spending, right? I mean, we're, we're moving to Office 365, we got a lot of storage, but there's sort of a double-edged sword there because again, as we look at how do we reduce risk, IT say, hey, we've got all this storage, we can, we can store everything forever. But then you have people on the legal, legal compliance side saying, no, no, but that's what we're trying to get away from. We need to make sure we uh, continue to govern some of this content. So uh, I want to open it back up to you know, Susan, uh, Bennett, Scott to, to uh, jump in here. Um, you know, and uh, as far as how you've seen some of these uh, benefits play out, especially in the context of an Office 365 environment. Yeah, with uh, just a point on the decreasing spending, um, you know, with uh, the IT folks in general are very excited about the fact that Office 365, just for email, um, the enterprise level gives every associate, like, I don't know, uh, 100, went from 150 to 100 gig recently. So they have a very large mailbox um, repositories, and then they can archive within the product, and there's all these kind of capabilities, and it, everybody gets uh, super excited about that. But when we start to think about it from the legal side or the information governance, uh, you know, records management point of view, it's, that that's not a good plan. So um, by by making sure, and it really comes down to a strategy. And so, you know, for our company. Our strategy is um, to apply the same rules, whether they're paper records or electronic records. And so we uh, are using a, a single tool to try to do um, records management for um, Honda when it comes to electronic records. We're using the ZL tool to do that. And we're also uh, using it for the e-discovery process. And that's the other piece of, of the strategy, is to try to do, use one tool to do um, both of those things. Right. No. And building on what Scott was saying, you know, from a, just an industry perspective, a lot of people feel like, oh, we're getting Office 365, that's a game changer. But the goals behind having a tool like ZLUA do not change when you implement Office 365, and in fact, they become more important. So some of the aspects Bennett touched on and that we spoke about earlier about how these are new content types. Now a uh, generation of these new types is accelerated. Your policies may need to change and yet you've now complicated an overarching strategy to address these silos. Um, really reinforces the original needs for having an archive, for having a unified governance approach. No, absolutely. And, and I think it's really important actually, you know, Scott, you hit on something talking about you know end users being able to archive, and and again, when when we talk about archiving here, again, we want to emphasize we're talking about it from from a governance perspective, right? I mean, an end user being able to archive his or her content for you know getting access to it later on, or to sort of clean up their mailbox or what have you, is a very very different context from what we're talking about here, which is really how does archiving broad base across the enterprise really sort of almost prepare you for a move like that? Because I, I think Susan, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you made a really good point that it actually makes, it, it it's actually becomes even more compelling to have that central control when, when you make that move. It's, you know, people tend to think, well, now I can do it within Office 365, but again, it ends up being just another big silo. So, um, Scott, yeah. I, mean, I think I wanted to get yeah, your Yeah, I, I, yeah. I definitely, I mean, from dealing, going through the project, uh, you know, planning phase, which we've um, been going through the last year and a half or so, um, I will. I will definitely tell you that um, you need every one of these tools that Microsoft provides as Office 365. They're all different, and they all have different parameters and settings and capabilities. And the email, the, the Outlook uh, Exchange product alone is, is 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 deep and wide. And so one of the features I was talking about is they have a feature called an archive uh, capability right in the product itself. It's not you know part of the ZL archiving. Um, so I didn't want to confuse anybody about that, but it is a feature that we said, hey, we don't want that turned on because we don't want users keeping even more content 
um, that that we're not archiving using our archive tool. So um, it, there's a lot of things. There's just a lot of things you got you got to consider when you're bringing in the product. So you know everybody on the information governance side really needs to sit in on the meetings as to what parameters and what features are out there on the product that you need to control. I mean it's 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 a big long list. I mean it's Skype. Yeah. Um, if you're bringing in Skype and the instant messaging, whether you're going to allow you know users to save the messages and things like that. So there's a lot of parameters that you might need to um, be focused. And what's really great about that is there are a lot of great features, but we should consider the impact of those from a bunch of different perspectives. So most importantly, what is the business impact? So if I unleashed you know chat across my enterprise, what business impact does that have? Sure, there's an efficiency process, but there's also it introduces a great deal of risk. And so how do you mitigate that? Um, same thing with like unified um, messaging, so you're getting you're not getting voicemail messages across uh, email. Um, the Skype, do you record Skype? Do you let it not? Do you let people create archives, which are like the old PSTs? These are there's not one answer that's good for every company, but it should be considered. And especially getting even deciding what you're going to migrate over. So much less what settings, what features you're going to have, how long you're going to keep stuff, what are you going to allow people to have access to. But then what are you actually going to move? You know, think about when you're moving houses, right? So we, you go out into your garage, which everybody's garage is just piled full of junk in all different places, and the, you know, your Easter stuff is come with your Christmas stuff, right? It's all over the place. And so one of the first things you do is you separate stuff you're going to keep from stuff you're going to throw away, and the stuff you keep you try to organize a little bit so that when you get to your new place, it's kind of organized. That's the same process you should be using when you're doing a migration, and this is where having um, an archive tool outside of the migration um, target, like 365, can be very helpful. So you get insight into your data to figure out what should go at all, but then how use the data to inform how that data should be organized, what kind of stuff do you have, and what, what its prevalence is, what kind of security it needs when it arrives in its new home. All of that can be very useful um, pre-migration. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And uh, you know, we uh, at Honda we had uh, the ZL tool, the archive tool, in place for a couple of our our companies. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have it for every one of the companies worldwide, and so kind of a worldwide effort. So um, we had to uh, our strategy as far as migration had to include moving everything that people had in Lotus Notes over to Office 365. Um, uh, you know, if we had the ZL tool in our company across all the uh, departments or all the companies at, at Honda, um, we could have uh, easily just migrated maybe 30 or 90 days of content, and it would have made the migration much smoother and much easier from a user uh, uh, and also from uh, the uh, team that's doing the migration. It would have made a lot easier um, and a smoother process for them. No, absolutely, and, and and I think again, you know, I I, I know I'm um, emphasizing it again and again, but a, again, when we talk about archiving, and and if this is a concept, Susan, that we talk a lot at Viewpoint about at ZL about, it, it's archiving from an information governance perspective, right? I mean, archiving traditionally has been about keeping more, and I think that's what Scott hit on. The reason a lot of people want that feature off is from a governance perspective. I already have a hundred gig mailbox that I have to deal with across my users. Um, we, we don't want to encourage even more and more storage for content that, uh, that, that isn't necess necessary for the business to actually keep and, and poses that risk. So this sort of archiving, is, it's, it's the cleanup. It's, it's what, you know, Bennett, you were talking about is have it all centralized so that whether you move to Office 365, whether it's on-premise, whether you have a hybrid, you have that centralized control. It doesn't matter where that data is sitting. Um, and, and you don't have to fit your governance policy to the application. You, you have a you know, purpose-built platform that's that's really allowing you to apply that governance regardless of where the where the content really is. Um, so, so with that, I mean, I, um, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I was gonna say it. It's getting out of the mindset of thinking about the cost of content around storage and thinking about the cost of content uh, and the value of content. So, keeping an item for as long as it has business value or regulatory legal compliance ramifications. And thinking about how changing access to that, creation of that, control of that impacts 
those processes. Right. It's really it's really allowed us at Honda to uh, apply our retention policies um, across all of these different silos, um, whether they're part of Office 365 or whether they're you know document them or drive uh, file shares or things like that that are outside. And even uh, we have also uh, uh, SharePoint sites that are um, in a hybrid mode. We have not. Uh, switched over to using Office 365. So it, it allows us to um, do the information governance um, uh, uh, you know, outside of the scope of Office 365. Thank you, Scott. No, that, that, that's, um, uh, no, that's a great perspective. And Susan, I mean, uh, and actually I'd open this up to everyone, but so as you look at Office 365, when you look at sort of those core components, e-discovery compliance, I mean, what are some of those gaps that, you know, we're seeing? I mean, broadly, we're talking about, you know, the concept that at the end of the day, Office 365, it is another big silo, and, and we do have other silos of data, and we need to find something to manage across. But if I am someone that is moving to Office 365, I, I don't have as much, most of my content is going there, what are some of those gaps that I need to sort of watch out for and make sure I really vet uh, before moving in? When we talk about gaps, for a small minority of companies, there are you know, who don't have to dip into their data very often. Um, you know, some of the, the um, e-discovery capabilities on e or e3 are all they need. Like really simple search, really simple preserve in place if they've got low volumes. You know, that's why 365 adoption of, among smaller companies is so um, popular. But for companies of any complex size. It's really critical when you say, Susan, to truly understand what the capabilities are, especially with your litigation profile, the volume of data you have to ship around. Um, I, I think that's the most critical piece to understand. Right. When you're looking for a uniform, consistent, comprehensive governance approach, um, having uh, the ability to apply policy across all your sources including Microsoft, but also non-Microsoft, and having um, the ability to establish workflows, access, controls in a consistent, uniform way, um, that, that becomes a struggle with Office 365. It changes not just where the data lives and is housed in terms of, okay, now it's, it's in a public cloud, but also in terms of how you access that content at different stages of it and how you share that mm -hmm. content between people when when you're ramping somebody mm -hmm. up, when you're onboarding, as well as when you're um, working on uh, somebody who's left the organization and need to process that data for how best to keep the things that are business value and or legal compliance required value. Because even some of the basic questions, right? Like so. There's very good materials out there on the differences, and so let's take the discovery suite between um, E3 and E5. And it's important, if, especially if your company has some developed e-discovery processes, like we search for this and you know we we try to you know sample our data, whatever it is, right? That there's only certain capabilities that are available, and so you know E3 has literally very basic search. Um, so even doing complicated searches, proximity searches, and things like that just aren't available in three. Now that may be great, may be just fine for what you normally do, but, but realize your search capabilities are going to impact your discovery volumes that you're sending out to outside counsel for further review. And so this is where it's important to start to think about the difference between the cost of E3 and E5. What capabilities does that give me, like proximity searching? I can export much more easily. Data, um, I can do much more ECA kind of work, so I'm lowering my data volumes. And, and the same on the data governance side, the information governance side. So what policies can I put in place with E3 versus E5, and how is that going to impact my further business and regulatory obligations? And, and Bennett, actually, um, we actually had a, a question come in from one of um, – uh, from, from the audience, uh, and I think it's timely to, to ask this right now, um, but, but the question is, what governance capabilities does Office 365 actually provide out of the box, out of the box in quotes, that, that yeah. you know, <laughs> classification, retention, disposition, um, so I, I think the, and, and, and I believe the question is more, again, going back to information governance disposition, yeah. 
Microsoft quickly points to Equivio, eDiscovery, but but that's that's sort of the the very basic stuff we need to have right before yeah. you can. So even let's consider. let's break that down. So governance means a lot of things. So we I write information governance very large. It includes privacy, security, records management, eDiscovery, right? So for the security side, so access controls, even data loss prevention, um, who's accessing what data, searches on credit card numbers and other regular expressions, there's more of that available in E3 than in E5. Uh, obviously, sorry, vice versa, E5 and then E3. You get basic stuff in E3, more in E5. The ability to search for, move, delete data, really isn't available until you get to E5, and even then it's just starting to get rolled out. So the priorities, like we were saying earlier, the priority of all the really cloud platform providers focused on access, then security, then e-discovery, and now governance. And so the true governance capabilities, being able to find and act on data, are very nascent even in um, the E5 level. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Bennett. So that that was um, that was one of the questions that we had from the audience. So appreciate you uh, addressing that. Um, so I, I do want to be cognizant of the time. We have um, just about four minutes left. So uh, sort of trying to wrap up and looking at some of the takeaways from from our discussion today. Uh, I want to take a minute to to summarize it and then uh, hand it back to you know Bennett, Scott, and and Susan to give some closing remarks or thoughts. Um, but first and foremost, and this goes right into the question that was just asked, be, be very cognizant of the different license types, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the different licensing options and the functionality that, that comes with it, right? I mean, between E3, E5, uh, it's very easy to say something very generic like, oh, it has e-discovery capabilities, but, you know, dive a little bit deeper. What e-discovery capabilities does it have? Is it actually going to help reduce my cost? Is it something that's going to fit into a, a streamlined, established e-discovery workflow I may already have in place? Um, and don't just keep the focus on e-discovery. How do I make sure that I have broader governance across all of all of this content? Um, an, another another key piece, of course, is understand you know how your users and and how your IT organization is going to leverage Office 365. What, what is going to be sort of the, the roadmap of um, applications that are used, content that's moved over, and remain cognizant that at the end of the day, Office 365, it provides a lot of great functionality uh, from a productivity perspective, but from a governance perspective, it's another big fat silo. So we need to make sure that we're, we're keeping in mind, how do I make sure my governance extends not just within Office 365, but to Susan's earlier point that it's it's as consistent and uniform across all my different content repositories, some which may be in 365, some may be other cloud repositories, and some will continue to remain on-premise. Um, consider a cleanup before the move. So this is something that you know Scott emphasized a lot and, and something he took away from his experience as well, that the more organized you are up front, you know, the more the more you clean out that garage before you make the move, it, it's that much easier. Uh, to actually make the transition and and get the most out of Office 365 because it, it, it's not a overnight it's not an overnight thing it is a multi-year multi-phase sort of a, a process uh, and it's important when you look at information governance that you're not just sort of ticking the boxes of hey can I do my legal holds but over the next three four five years what are other considerations that I need to keep in mind what are other content types that we might look at um, and how do I make sure that my information governance strategy is not forced to be Office 365 centric, that it is a, a centralized uniform strategy that I can apply across all content, whether it's in Office 365 or, or sitting in another repository. Um, you know, the, the, one of the last points, which is certainly not lost on our audience today or, or anyone sitting on this panel here, get your business users involved. Talk to legal, talk to compliance. They need to have a seat at the table when you're making this decision. They don't necessarily have to be the decision maker. Um, we're not saying that IT you know, can't make that transition and say that, okay, we're making the move to Office 365 because there's so many compelling reasons to do so. But, but make sure it's thought out with those stakeholders in mind. How are they going to be able to meet their legal obligations? How are they going to be able to drive their governance strategy moving forward as you make that move? 
how can you get input from them on things that may impact the overall enterprise? You know, Scott made a very good point of, hey, we said turn that archiving piece off because even though from an IT perspective, it might say, well, we're giving end users all this functionality, you know, somewhat storage, the ability to, to retain all this content. Um, from a legal perspective, it's a double-edged sword, right? There's a lot of risks that we take on in doing that as well. So it's, it's absolutely critical to make sure that your legal records compliance stakeholders have a seat at that table as you look at that roadmap of how you're going to um, move forward. Um, so um, so with just a couple minutes left, Susan Bennett uh, and uh, uh, Scott, firstly, thank you so much for joining us. But I did want to open it up back to you uh, just for the last minute or two for any other closing remarks or takeaways that um, we want to emphasize for the audience. I, I would just add that your archiving strategy, a tool like CL Unified Archive and Office 365, these, these are compatible. And if anything, an, an archive, a tool can help you smooth and accelerate your adoption of Office 365. And in any, you know, makes you have more flexibility and agility for any future opportunity your organization may get to take advantage of. So um, they really do complement and work well together to give you the control, visibility, access that, that you need from a governance perspective. And I think that's really one of the key takeaways is understand that all these tools have different capabilities. A torque wrench does something different than a jackhammer, right? And it's not that one's better than the other. They just do different things. And so really trying to understand what are your business objectives in trying to go to 365. And then with all the different ramifications of the settings and what level of licensing I'm going to do, what implications does it have? It's kind of like mission control at NASA. You've got like navigation people and engine people and systems people who are experts in that. And so they get their perspectives when they're putting a mission together. That's just what you should do at your organization. Have IT, business, legal, regulatory, RIM, HR you know, at the table so that they can give their perspectives so your, your overall program is clearly defined and you know which tools are best and how to combine them. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bennett and, and Susan. First and foremost, a big thanks to our panel. Thank you, everyone, so much for, for joining us for this. Uh, we certainly hope that this was uh, helpful. And um, as, uh, as you'll see as a follow-up to the webinar, if you do have other questions, um, inquiries, things that you'd uh, like to send in, we're more than happy to respond to those as well. Um, but uh, Bennett, Susan, Scott, thank you again. And um, hope everyone has a great rest of the week.